Sports Walk is back. Watch season two of Backpack Broadcasting's original web series that brings you the opinions of real sports fans. The entire first season and current season are available now on the Sports Walk YouTube channel and Facebook page. Check out the 2017 NYC WebFest official selection and see what other sports fans have to say on the hottest issues in sports today. It's easy. Just take the Sports Walk. Hard to Tell podcast in the new year from the Gotham Podcast Studios. Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca. This is episode 59, first episode of 2019. Happy New Year, man. Yeah, happy New Year. I'm about to be 25 years old. How about that? Oh, my God. You're going to be so <laughs> old. Whatever shall we do? We're going to be 25. I feel old. My chest, my man, chest, shut, man, my chest was hurting the other day. Man, shut up. <laughs> Oh please! <laughs> what do you look at that L- laughing? Oh, the youthful, the youthful laugh of Brian Fonseca Man. talking about I'm going to be 25. I just, I just hope I age well. That's it. I don't worry about that. I mean, that's that's not that's not my only Health-wise concern. Health wise or looks wise, both. Okay, that's not my only concern, but that's one of my main concerns. Just aging concerned well. Concerned about aging well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I'm I'm pretty responsible with eating. So I think I think I'll be good with that. No, guys, he just downed a brownie before he came here. <laughs> nah, I'm like not telling the whole story. He had a protein brownie. Am I right. right? Was that a protein brownie? Yes. Okay. The, the, although I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh, it's the same thing as eating, you know, grilled chicken with freaking. No, you but know. when you decided to indulge in something sweet, you decided to go on the healthier. Yeah, side. I got it. I got yeah. it from. I'll, I'll I'll mention the store even though they don't sponsor us. Should I do that or no? Nah. No. All right. Fine. <laughs> I mean, but I, did, it, I really didn't care. Was but but it's a healthy eating store. Uh, that yeah. is low. It's a chain. We'll just say that it's a chain throughout New York City. Okay. Yeah. So even when Brian has his sweets, he tries. To, well, that's a good thing to be doing for twenty five. And Brian has been doing this. This is not a New Year's resolution, which I'm sick about all y'all. Y'all New Year's. Oh, I want. I do want to get your thoughts on that though. We talked about it last year in the first podcast, <laughs> and you know my my thoughts are. I will I will sum this up again. My problem with New Year's resolutions is, especially via social media, nobody's held accountable for this. Right. Right. That's true. And I got a little. That's for a lot of things. A lot of things. But I got a little bit tired of the people like, you probably saw these memes. It's like, oh, well, I am throwing out all the old friends. I'm not bringing you into Those are my favorites. Man, shut up. Those are my favorites. Oh, That they're cutting people off. Cutting people off. Announcing it to the world. World. Really? (laughs) Like, are you really cutting people off effectively if you're announcing it? So then the people who get cut off. They are supposed to be worried about the fact that you cut them off. And then they have the meme, which I didn't see this year, but they usually have the meme with the woman holding. Oh, I think I mentioned this last year when we did the same podcast, holding all the bad, holding yeah. all the good stuff, and then stepping on all the bad stuff. Or yeah. maybe I have that reversed. I don't know. Um, I'm pretty much I'm over it with people. Like, yeah. But I, I do, I do have some things that I do want to set out to accomplish this year. I wouldn't call them New Year's resolutions. They're more they're just goals. They're just goals. Yeah, the slight um, goals. Yeah, and my family, when I was with them for New Year's, did the whole thing where, you know, you eat 12 grapes and make 12 wishes to try to make them, like, come true. You never heard of this? That's a thing? Yeah, so basically... Why grapes? I, I don't know. I just learned about this Why recently. can't it be 12 strawberries? Why can't it be 12 <laughs> apples? Why, I mean, I like why? grapes more than I mean, I like grapes, so I'm just, why grapes? I'm find it interesting. Right, but I don't know. I don't remember what it was, Um, but you just eat 12 of them. Like, right as soon as it hits New Year's, you have a minute, you have 60 seconds to do it, and you have to make the wishes in your head... At a better chance that nah, they come true. I don't like it. Yeah, so wait, I don't wait, know. wait, hold on. I just participated in it just because. I was about, and to say, I do hope that those things come true. But we'll I was see. going to say I didn't <laughs> like the time that you're forced to do it in, but I'm wondering, do you do it at 11:59 before it hits no, midnight? No, you do it right at 12. So you have from 12 to 12:01 to you do this. You do your happy New Year and then boom, get grapes, bong, 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 one so, by one by one. So there's a lot of people in your family after they took their swig of champagne or shot or whatever they did. Yeah, which then, I did not do. They then uh, took, they then downed a bunch of grapes right exactly okay yeah all right it was a very interesting it was a very interesting no i mean i I, listen i'm not (laughs) gonna say i just find it interesting i find the time interesting that you have to do it within a minute yeah i don't i look it was a concept it was i i approached it like a game where there's low risk high reward possibilities so i feel good about it i feel like i feel like if you can do 12 grapes in a minute like that's like the next step to prepare for the nathan's hot dog eating contest well if you really think about it it's like if you break it down 60 seconds in a minute, you have 12 grapes. So you have basically five seconds per grape. Yeah. That's not that hard. 
But you gotta make, swallow the grape while you're making the wish. You gotta like plan these wishes. Or in you could just do what you would think that I probably did, which I may or may not have done, and just throw them all in your mouth one by one by one by one by one by not even finishing the one before. Just kind of just you definitely did. I just choking them down yeah. at the same time, yeah, squeezing like three of them together so then they go down smoothly. You ever did that with like Starburst? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I like to enjoy my Starburst. <laughs> and I love Starburst. One at a time. I do too. Halloween, oh my God, I went crazy. Yeah, I remember a couple of years ago you had, a, I think it was a, a video of you eating Starburst. While and then listen, I, I was like, no more, to, no yeah. more. I did it again on Halloween, except I didn't make the video. I was just like, whatever. I, the, so the you Nets, should make it your news resolution to stop doing that. The Nets were playing, I think the Nets were playing the Pistons that night. I think the Nets were playing the Pistons. Let me make sure. Why do you, why do you why do you remember that? I think because I was covering the game. Yeah, the Nets were playing the Pistons that night, and I remember that uh, what's it called? It was on Halloween, and I remember they put these little bowls out for the media, and they all had candy in it. I was on the hunt for the Starburst, for like the good stuff. And I remember that game too because Spencer Dinwiddie has somewhat of a revenge game where he had another buzz, uh, another game winner against Detroit, which forced Iron Eagle to say the following. So, yeah. Which that call was also used in uh, my uh, little story that we did. Right. So I heard that a million times. Right. Um, Gives me an excuse to bring back the soundboard, which I added some sounds to. So yeah. Which, oh, that's something Brian did for the new year that none of us are happy about. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, we just heard a sound from the NBA. So NBA has been interesting. We're going to do something a little bit different. It's going to be an NBA-heavy podcast today. But we're going to talk a little bit more about a lot of times we talk about what's going on at the top of the league, who's mm. doing really good, who's killing it, who's the contenders. We're going to talk about contenders in another realm today. <laughs> a lot of people contend for the top spot, who's going to win the NBA championship. But today we want to talk about the contenders for the bottom. Right. The contenders who are going for that top spot in the NBA draft. <laughs> and one of those teams includes my very own New York Knicks. <laughs> and I'm smiling about this. I don't know why. Well, you're not I'm smiling, smiling about that win that they had against the Lakers. No. I was, I, here's the thing. Before that game, they had uh, lost eight in a row. I am... I, I'm always concerned about teams getting used to losing. I've brought this up on the podcast before. You don't want to get used to the culture of losing. That's I never agree. good. No, I, I, so I think when you 100%. could stop the Knicks, really, I think that was their longest losing streak of the year, if I'm not mistaken. You want to stop those long losing streaks every once in a while to get a win. It's good to remind the guys. Now, to the Knicks' credit, unlike mm-hmm. some other thinking teams, the Knicks have been playing hard. Right. They have not. There's been a unlike they, unlike Cleveland. Right. Right. Been, totally not competitive no the culture of losing thing is very important because i feel like that doesn't get talked about enough which is why i i remember when the nets were eight and 18 i think it was eight and 18 or was it 10 and 18 but regardless they were on an eight game losing streak and i remember thinking like look some people were saying that maybe they should tank and i was like man i don't know if that'd be good because then you're talking about a third year of being one of those bottom teams in the nba and i actually know this from experience because in high school my junior year <clears throat> Excuse me. When uh, we were a bad team, pretty much. Granted, we had a lot of guys like that couldn't stay eligible with grades and stuff like I that. Remember those days, <laughs> <very well. laughs> right? But the reason why I bring this up is because the next year, when we were better and we were mostly at full strength, we didn't really know how to win. Yep. We lost a lot of games in the fourth quarter down the stretch because that's a real thing. Like, because you're not, you haven't been there because the f- previous year we were getting blown out a lot. So then my senior year. We're beating teams that we probably shouldn't have been beating or we feel like we're on par with or whatever the case may be. But we were beating these teams probably for three quarters. I remember we had a game against Berkeley Carroll once. We were beating them for three quarters. And then in the fourth quarter, we just choked. We just coughed it up, well, it, and they beat us by, like, three points. Well, you said the thing. You didn't know how to win. That's the thing. <laughs> and that's the that's value. That's, you so so that. I say that to say in the NBA, it's the same thing. In college, it's the same thing. If you have guys who have been there for one, two, three years, and then that next season – you're supposed to make that leap, they're not going to know how if they're so used to losing all the time. So to your point, yeah, I think it's good that the Knicks are playing hard, but they can't just tank outright and not get Ws. But you also, what you want, what you want is competitive tanking. What you want is to lose with the young guys. You want them to play <laughs> yeah. as hard as possible, be in all the close games, and keep losing 112 to 108, 99, 96, 105, 104, and end the season with like 23 wins. Yeah, and a shot at the number one overall pick. Because I think you learn, you learn, I think there's a lot to be learned in those games, no matter, even though the Knicks are 10 and whatever, 29, 29 or whatever. As if we're recording th- th- this podcast. There's, at, at the time we're recording this podcast, there's a lot to be learned in those games, losing those close losses. And for the most part, what I've seen for the Knicks, maybe outside of maybe five or six games where they were 
really not competitive or lost it in the quarter. They fought pretty hard. So for me, this is going to sound very weird for a fan of a tw- 10 and 29 team, but I've been pretty happy with how the year has gone based on actually what I thought. Now, they're probably a little bit behind what I predicted for them in wins. I think I had them anywhere between 24 to 28 wins uh, in that range. I could have seen them. They're, they're not kinda, far, they're they're not not far, far from that off pace. Of that pace. Yeah. I'm also not necessarily rooting for them to hit that pace. But you know but you know what's going to happen. Is like they'll, they'll probably enter April with like 20, and then they'll end the season like 7-4 and four or something like oh, that. I don't want that. They're, they're, that always happens. That. that happened last I year. I, no, that, that's why <laughs> I don't want that. Yeah, but you did get Kevin Knox. I mean, who's yes, the rookie of the month in December, who, and has been looking good. He's, and and people, I don't, I don't think the Knicks are that far off, man. I really don't. Neither do I, because I actually think that they're doing things the right way. And I, I know there's a, a contingent of Knicks fans, and we'll get to the Nets in one second in this too. A contingent, and goes to your point about. We're gonna, I want to go back to a conversation you and I had when the Nets were eight and eighteen. Um, we talked mm. about the stretch that was coming up for them. Mm. We'll get to that. That, f- that big home. We talked yeah. about that, but for the Knicks, I was a fan of David Fisdale's hiring. Same. I've said this before. Yep. I also have been a fan of what he's done in terms of coaching the team this year. We some allegedly people, look alike. Yes, you do. <laughs> some people will say uh, he's pulled guys in and out the rotation. He also had some injuries to deal with. Kevin Knox wasn't hurt in the beginning of the year. Obviously, KP is out. Um, Mitchell Robinson. Mitchell Robinson has now hurts. been out for. I haven't yet. Now they're going to when he comes back. Hopefully, in the next couple of games are going to try to reassimilate him back into uh, the rotation. But look, guys have gotten opportunities. Noah Vonleh. Uh, Luke Cornett recently, who's been – can't guard anybody, but he's been playing pretty good offensively. Um, you've seen – I'm not a big Emmanuel Moutier fan, but offensively he's been pretty good. Um, you've seen opportunities for guys. Dotson, these young guys have gotten valuable minutes, competing hard, and I still go back – I don't think I mentioned this podcast. I loved when Fisdale – I think it was against the Warriors early in the season – changed the starting lineup, put all the young guys in, and let them play against the Warriors, and they hung with them for three quarters before Durant went nuts. I love that. Go out there, Absolutely. take your lumps, mm-hmm. learn. They're learning on the fly. Mm-hmm. This is going to be better for these guys. I, he's been adamant about not sending Mitchell Robinson and some other guys to the to the G League. Um, no, Mitchell should be playing right now. Right now, I, w- I would uh, I would gradually bring him back, but start him when he when he's like good to go. Go. So, I mean, if you want, in terms of coming back from rehab, I'm fine with him. But what I want to say is, I, there's something to be said about learning on the job. There's something to be said about doing that. There's something to be said about learning how to lose in the NBA. That's how you told me. You can see how <laughs> right. You can see how he's learning. Uh, Kevin Knox, excuse me, has learned. Kind of lit a fire on him early. Knox was coming back from injury. People were questioning his motor. He got now. Knox is playing hard. Is he doing everything right? No. No. He's he's, he's playing 19. hard. Some guys have gotten benched. Trey Burke's playing one time. Nilakina was playing. Then he got benched. I'm fine with holding people accountable. What some of y'all ain't doing to other people on social media with New Year's resolutions. But I'm fine with holding (laughs) people accountable. This is what's got to happen. This is what you have to do. And in terms of that, look, I think it would be fantastic if the Knicks can get a top three pick. I think it would be fantastic if they can get Zion Williamson. But I'm not going to talk too much about that. Like, I won't talk too much about Kevin Durant. Or R.J. Barrett. R.J. Barrett. I'm still still campaigning for some respect to be put on R.J. Barrett's name because people keep mentioning Zion Williamson. I, I think Zion Williamson, people like the body and what they think he can do. They like the, the highlights. NBA. They like the, the yes. athleticism. I think athleticism sometimes is overrated. I think I, you and I both I, agree I, with this. I agree but, a lot. Not, but, to, not to say that Zion Williamson is. not going to be good. Because I think he's going to be good. So do I. But I like R.J. Barrett better for the NBA style. My concerns with R.J. Barrett. Shot selection. Efficiency, efficiency. and the shot selection. That's been my concern. But, that, but that's what it is with shooters and, they, and well, they're we young. Don't, we don't, yeah, I mean, he's young. <laughs> We just don't need another Tim Hardaway Jr. Um, so I, I, he'll we, be better than that. Yeah, he might be better than that right now. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, the Knicks are actually in this good position. The bottom of the race in the NBA has gotten very interesting at the time of recording this podcast. We have the Cleveland Cavaliers with the worst record. They have eight wins, thirty-one losses. Suns have nine wins, thirty-one losses. Knicks are ten and twenty-nine. So the Chicago Bulls, Atlanta Hawks, eleven and twenty-seven. There was just a couple weeks ago. The Knicks were probably three games out of the top, the top spot in determining the top. Worst record that you would have in the league. That's why. That's why I try not to get too crazy with standings, like on a day by day basis. Phoenix won four games in a row at a point, and it's hard. It's hard to separate it, especially if, like, for example, you're me and you're around the Nets all the time. You try not to get too wrapped up in one single game because then you lose sight of this is an 82 game season. I it's mean, a long season. You know what I mean? Like, if you look, like, let me pick Miami for example. Right, they're 19 and 18 right now at the time we're recording this podcast. They're the sixth seed. If they go on a seven game losing streak all of a sudden and they're nineteen and twenty six and then they never sort of recover from that and they end their season thirty three and 
49. This is not something you're going to see coming now. I think you just have to wait. You yeah. just have to wait well, for certain And that happen. transition, just look at the Nets. At the time, they were 8-18. Eight and 18. Uh, You were talking to me, and we had a phone conversation about, hey, they had this. you talked and you wrote about it, how they have this oh, it's a 14-game stretch coming up. And we were looking at, like, hey, where can they get these wins? This Who is the make-or-break stretch. This make or, and I thought it was fine. I thought your point was fine. I thought it was the make-or-break stretch. For you— It clearly made it clear, them. <laughs> well, and there still is ways to go. Right. But but for now. You brought that up, and now you've seen them play. And they, they won what? Did they win 10 They won 10 They've won 11. They, they've won 11 of their last uh, 14 games. 14 games. They're 11 and 3. And 3. Now, do you, they are what, now 19 and 21. They, you could, they had a point where they could have tanked. At 88 eight and 18, or there was people talking about tanking. Yeah. And now they're not in tank mode. Now, at the time of recording this podcast, they are sitting as the A seed in the Eastern Conference. Uh, how do you feel about them coming out of it? Um, is tanking better for the Nets? They control their own pick? Or is it like, hey, look, we're here. We're going for it. What do you think they, sh- they should be doing? No, I think this goes back to our earlier point. Sort of like the Knicks. It's like they're playing hard, and they should continue to play hard. But for them... You also have to see the wins now because the Knicks are one. The Nets are one year ahead of the Knicks, for example, in terms of like their rebuild. The Knicks really are just starting from zero now. Porzingis is out. They got a lot of new young players. They have new head coach with the Nets. This is their third year with Kenny Atkinson with Sean Marks. So it's like now it's time to see the results. And I've said even from the beginning of the season, they were not bad enough to tank. I thought that they had a little bit too much talent. To, I agree with that. Yeah, and even now they're winning these games with their best player is still injured. Yep. You know what I mean? So you have all, like, why not? Just go for it. Go for the playoffs. Sean Marks has proven that he can draft. Of his six draft picks, five of them are NBA players, and the other one that wasn't an NBA player is currently a stash in Europe. He's still there, uh, mm-hmm. Alexander Vizenkov. Isaiah Whitehead is one of the other five, and he's somebody who I reported is going to be on his way back at some point. Yes. Right, so... Well, I, and you look you look at the standings in the East. The Nets are only a game and a half out of the sixth spot. Um, they could easily be high as that. The Miami and Charlotte are ahead of them. I think them. Uh, I had them at thirty eight and forty four going into the season. I remember that. That's what you had. Yep. I had them, Charlotte, Detroit, Detroit. Miami. They're all going to be fighting for like those last couple Detroit, spots. Detroit has not been good in the last couple weeks. Orlando's really fallen off in about the last three weeks. W- expected. Um, or like I just the Wizards uh, awfully got a huge blow, and they're still four four and a half games out. Excuse me. Th- yeah, four and a half games out. Yeah. Uh, their team want to talk about too because. They're in a very interesting spot. Yeah. They're now, uh, at this time recording the podcast, 15 and 24. They found out John Wall's gone for the season. And we, they were supposed to be one of those six automatics going yep. to the playoffs in the Eastern and Conference. Then, and They're they were, done now. They, they've been a mess uh, for many years. We talked about this when we had Gerard on here, the last time we had Gerard on here, yeah. about what we think they should do. Should they trade Bradley Beal, um, which I still don't think is a possibility they might want to think about exploring. Their team right now, you look at them, you're like, yo, they might need to, they need to tank. Yes, they don't need to be in this middle of mediocrity. They're kind of still close to that edge of mediocrity, but they're not really in that tank group. I think the tank group is Atlanta Bulls, Knicks, Cavs, Suns. Clearly in the tank. Group. You know, it's clearly. I thought Atlanta was going to be worse, but they've been winning some games lately. Just like Phoenix, they had with, a little surge without Tari and Prince. Also, I do. I do think that they're, they'll hit a wall. I'm sure at some point. I mean, you know, I don't think Trey Young's going to be. He he's shown me some things as a passer recently, but I don't think he's going to be like playing at such a high level later on in the season. That's going to win them a lot of games. Sound like our friend Darrell Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, like, I just don't think he's going to win them a lot of games down the stretch. I I'm a big John Collins fan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but I just don't. I I think at some point you're going to see the cold month where they go three like three and thirteen. I still don't think they're going to be very. I good. mean, they've they've won at the time of this podcast. They've won. Uh, they split their last ten. Which has gotten them to eleven wins. I want to get. I want to get. I want to get to a few things. Uh, I want to get to Bradley Bill. I want to get to Knicks, and I want to get to a little bit more on the Nets because of that. They have. They all have interesting situations. But with Bradley Beal first, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. He has three years left on his contract. Mm-hmm. This year, next year, the year after. So two after this season. He's due to make twenty five, twenty seven, and twenty eight point seven million. So you're saying that they should rebuild without him? Just let him go. Not let him go, but trade him. Here's the thing. The ideal thing would be to rebuild with him because, and I want to say this in terms of the money structure that you just mentioned. 25, uh, 26, and then you said 28 million, I think it was. I, he's worth that, I would say. Bradley Beal is a friendly contract. 
Yeah. There are people who will trade for that contract because I know it sounds like a lot of money, but he ain't going to be making what John Wall's going to be making next year. That's the problem. And who you want to pay John Wall right now? Now. And and Look, by the way, they still owe Otto Porter the rest that, of see, his money. This, this is, who's making basically what Bradley Beal's making. But this is where it comes into my point, right? Yeah. You're paying Otto Porter what you're paying Bradley Beal, right? But he's not as tradable. John Wall is damaged goods. He's had two knee surgeries. He's now got this uh, other surgery that's coming up. Damn, he's damaged not, goods. Damn. <laughs> he's damaged goods at this point. You have, Like, John Wall could come back and be fine. I'm not saying that he won't. I'm just saying you have to legitimately worry about can he play a whole season. When's the last time John Wall played a whole season? Uh, let's look that up. There we go. When's the last time <laughs> he played 75 games in a season? Let's look that up because it ain't. It, here's the, here's the issue. It has not he's, been. He's, he's 28. Said. He'll be 29 in September before next season. And the last time that he's done that was 2016, 2017. So two seasons ago. There you go. This year he'll his season's over now. He played 32 games last year. He played 41 games, but still an All Star. Um, and before that, he had a healthy stretch of four seasons. Yeah, he did. The beginning of his career, he had some injury issues. Then he was healthy for a while. And that was sort of like his peak. And then the last couple of years, people have cooled off on him. He's one of those guys, unfortunately, maybe his peak came early, which is not something that we talk about enough when it comes to young players. Because some of these guys come in the league at 19 and the NBA, you know, they're in there for four or five years. Some of these guys will peak at by 25 years old. Some of it is because sometimes those guys, their game is predicated on speed. And when you get injuries, that takes away from that. And you have multiple surgeries, you're not going to be the same. Athleticism. The only person I've literally in this league right now seen being able to adjust on that, whose game is really predicated on speed a lot, is Russell, Russell Westbrook. Westbrook. And so he's an anomaly. He's a gym rat. So. I'm not say- I don't know. Everybody's body is different. And by the way, his uh, Eastern Conference equivalent from back in the day, Derrick Rose. Yep. Now that he has reinvented himself, yep. thankfully. But look at what it took to get there. My yeah. God. How many years did it take to get there? Th- now, th- that was the comparison. But that on. may ha- John Wall may have to be doing a little bit of that. But here's my thing. It's back to the point. You have Otto Porter. Who wants Otto? What's the trade market like right now for Otto Porter? Probably not that great. John Wall. I mean, the Nets did. Did, did sign him to that offer sheet, he but did. I think now you can't, you can't, you can't do. I don't think there's out. much. I don't think there's much unless well, you're going to attach. He's he's owed twenty six million this year, twenty seven point two next year, and he has a player option for twenty eight point five million the following year. Guaranteed this to be is, picking that up. This is the same, pretty much the same as Bradley Beal, but but not Bradley the, Beal not is, the same as John Wall. My my <laughs> thing is, unless you know there's somebody that could trade for John Wall. I think there might have been some teams that no. before you make it forty million before this injury. I think you might have got a team like Miami that might have still said we need to start. We, we always think it. it's gonna be Miami <laughs> because they will do that. Because Pat Riley, Pat Riley ain't here for a long time. He's here for a good time. So, yeah. Like. So he's trying to go and do that. <laughs> now I don't know anybody else. Maybe you want to say Phoenix are desperate for a point guard, but not at forty billion. Orlando not at forty million. That's the thing. That's the problem. Yeah. Not at for the only person, the only team I can see doing it for forty million is Miami because they're in cap hell and he needs something. That, right, you need a team. There's no other team that's that that's desperate. So, right, you could not, and, and the Knicks probably would have been at one no. point in time. But I feel like they're not doing, under this regime. Yeah, exactly. I no. feel like this is, and I want to, I want to get to them in a second. But so, I, what I yeah. want to say is, in all in a perfect world, it makes sense because of what you're paying Bradley Beal, and the other lack of flexibility that you have in your roster as the Washington Wizards to build around Bradley Beal. But I don't see how you can. Like, trading Bradley Beal is actually, to me, your best option. It's the only way you can get better out of the way that you are it, the, the, as fast. There, there, talk, there was a report that came out yesterday that they want uh, two first-round picks for Bradley Beal. He might be able to get it. Two first-round picks for Bradley Beal. Yeah. They yeah, might. I would say I would say so. Because he's under team control for I would three say years so, at a pretty good number. I don't think you're getting that for John Wall. I don't think you're getting nope. that for Otto Porter either. Nope. Bradley Beal is definitely the player on that roster that will get you the most back. Um, and what sucks is they just made a trade where they gave up Kelly Oubre mm. to go for it with getting a veteran like Ariza, and now they might have to shop Ariza again. Now, Ariza could still be valuable for them. Somebody's going to want him. Rockets might want him back. Oh, yeah. See, see, now now we're getting into that interesting point in time, and I love this because like now you're going to see who's really desperate, like who's really going to go for it. Are the Knicks going to be able to move Emmanuel Moutier, Enos Cantor, and get picks? Or is Trevor Ariza going to have that value and be shopped immediately to another team? What's going to happen with D'Angelo Russell, Damari Carroll, 
You know what I mean? Like all these sort of things, and we have like a month left in trade deadline. I think a lot of it depends on. We're talking about this now, at the beginning of January, but where are you at the beginning of February? We're gonna have to revisit this at the beginning of next month. Where you are there is really going to matter in terms of what you can do. I think the teams that we know that are out of it, the teams I mentioned that are definitely tanking, they're in. Is Orlando desperate to still make the playoffs? Are they gonna want to try to go get a point guard? Right. See, they're one of those teams that fall into what we were talking about earlier too. They've been losing too much. You know what I mean? Like over the last, when was the last time Orlando had a good season? Have they had a good season since Dwight Howard left? Well, de- well, did de- this? Okay, hold on. But that's what happens into this whole tanking equation, right? Mm-hmm. Now you have an organization like Orlando that you bring up. They're starved. Their fan base is starved. They might look at the season. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but they might be looking at the season saying, "Yo, we got to get into the playoffs." Mm-hmm. So, but and they and this is what happens. With, that might not necessarily be the best thing for the team long term, but that's what they might do. This is what happens with these organizations in not just basketball, but in all sports that keep firing coaches every few years mm-hmm. because they keep trying to reset, 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 and they never could string together any level of consistency. Charlotte's in that position too. They might want to say, "We got to make kids playoffs. We got to bring in somebody else to help Kemba because Jeremy Lamb is the second player, best player in the team, and that's not good." And you don't want to waste the prime years of those guys because Kemba Walker is somebody who is. Pretty much the same age as John Wall, I think. He's also 27, 28 years old. But here's old, the problem. And he's about to hit free agency. He, he, they're another good one. But is Charlotte really better be getting into the playoffs this year? Does that really help that organization move forward? I mean, the, To me, the answer is no. N- no, because like... Because they're poorly constructed. J- James see, Ro- I think they should have traded Kemba last year to Miami. I agree. But with Michael Jordan and that regime in place, I just don't think that they ever... See, they, they're the other side of the equation. <clears throat> excuse me, where tanking is never good for them. You know what I mean? Like, they just never want to tank, even though they probably should. Whereas other teams like Orlando, they're tanking too much, and they're not even doing it correctly because they never get to the top end of the draft. And they wind up with the Jonathan Isaacs and the Mo Bambas, who are not quite Luka Doncic, or I don't even know who was the first pick of Jonathan Isaacs draft. That was 2017. Markel Fultz? Never mind. Yeah. Uh, Jason Tatum. <laughs> right, they're never getting into that top three. Orlando hasn't been quite that bad to get there. So look, some of that is luck. This is why I have no problem. I hope maybe the Knicks can get in the top three. The worst place in the NBA you want to be is it's that the middle. middle. Yep. Yeah. So and, and some of these teams have been in the middle for a while. The Pistons, the Hornets, uh, the Magic. That's why I think t- all tanking isn't equal. Yeah. Right. The net situation right now, where you talked about where they could tank, is a little bit different. Orlando's the, even the a Nets are different. not. The Nets are not. They're, they, they're they, not. They should go. They should go and make for the. They make the playoffs, and here's why. Because, and they're probably going to. They're probably gonna, they're going to be in that conversation. I don't know what they're going to do with D'Angelo Russell yet. I keep saying that. That's it. I literally my mind changes every every week on what they're going to try to do because his play sort of is up and down, up and down every week. Mm-hmm. Now he's on a great stretch, and mm-hmm. by this time next week, how do I know that he's not going to be five of fifteen shooting with fourteen points, five assists, and sitting at the end of a fourth quarter once again? Like I don't know that that's not going to happen. Well, inconsistency like that makes you think that an organization would probably want to trade a player. Yeah, but I don't know because, like, he's also shown that he's had these high-level games, especially passing the ball lately where he's had 13 assists on top of 22 points, and then he had a 33-point game recently. Like, it's just up and down, up and down all the time. He does have career numbers across the board. And here's the thing. Mm -hmm. It's the imperfections, and I wrote about this recently because I wrote about uh, sort of that whole situation, but it's the imperfections of the rookie wage scale. And what I mean by that is you get these guys who nowadays are usually 19 years old and you get them on these contracts, which are essentially four-year contracts with two team options. You accept, accept, then they're there for four years. D'Angelo Russell is in his fourth season. We don't know if he can touch that consistency yet. He's trying to do that. And he will be 23 years old in February. So you can say like, oh, we could sign him now, and then he'll be very good. He'll mm-hmm. eventually touch that ceiling. We sign him to a max deal, and then that expires when he's 27. You know what I mean? So or then you, he'll or be, you can do, you can do that, and then you could have Andrew Wiggins. That's the thing. I you don't you legitimately don't, don't know. know because people forget Andrew Wiggins was great his third season. He was averaging 23, 24 points a game, if Looking I'm not mistaken. Efficiency, gutting after it defensively, and then that fourth season comes, and boom. And that was the fourth year of that rookie of that rookie contract, he went down a little bit, but he still sold enough flashes where he got that max contract. I think he might have gotten that uh, uh, even before that. I think he might have gotten in the summer before his fourth year. I'm actually going to check that now. And now you're in a situation where you want to move that contract if you're Minnesota. But you cannot. 
Because nobody much like much like John Wall. Well, nobody's touching that. Nobody's touching that at all whatsoever. And you could say like, oh, D'Angelo Russell's a little bit more dynamic. He's a he's more of a passer, the system that. But how do you know definitively that that's not going to happen? In the same situation, how do you, you know? Don't, you don't. You don't because you don't they're know. both the same age, and these are both guys who were top picks. I think Angelo, uh, uh, Angelo, um, Andrew Wiggins was the top pick in that draft, pick ahead up. of Jabari Parker. D'Angelo Russell was second overall the very next year. How do you know you that it's going to be definitively look, this, different? I, I, tr- I don't I tr- even know if the Nets know right yeah, now. Yeah, but I, I think try- they're still trying to figure out, which is why they haven't made a decision yet. Look, I, and I understand that they should take their time in making that decision if right. they can't. And I also don't think there's this thing that fans do where it's like you have to get something back for somebody if you're not going to use them. Well, also sometimes maybe the best thing is actually just letting them walk away on Russell. Yes, Andrew Wiggins signed that contract before his. I fourth thought so season. before his fourth season because he balled out in that third season. And it was five years, one hundred forty-seven point seven maximum money. How you think they feel about paying him every week? Awful. When they see how he's when they see how he's playing. Awful. And they probably feel worse because of that whole Jimmy Butler situation. Somewhat exposed. Because Jimmy that. Butler kind of was telling them. But here's the thing: yes. this is a very real thing too. And I'm not saying this was the case with Andrew Wiggins, even though it appears that way. And I'm not saying this is the case with D'Angelo Russell, because I do, I legitimately do not think it's the case. But some guys are motivated by money. We all are. We all are as people. We're motivated by money. Right. You want to do better when you know your contract's coming up because you want a big contract. And it's a human thing to want to coast afterwards. Like, oh, I got the money. I'm good. I can relax a little bit. And then you maybe take a little bit of time off and then it hinders your performance that first season. Or maybe you're never the same again. I don't know. I don't know that he's not thinking about that. You know what I'm saying? I don't know that he is thinking about that, but I'm just saying that is a very real thing with athletes, with people in general, where you want to get to that money, and then as soon as you get there, you sort of take the gloves off for a second, you put your feet up and relax a little bit, and then your performance is not as good. That is a very real thing, and I don't know that that's not the case here. I think the Nets are still trying to figure that out. I don't think people put that in the equation enough when it comes to talking about sports. And people don't talk about this enough. This a lot. People right. don't talk about mentality the, enough. The problem is you're investing in that too when you're paying someone right. for anything. You're also investing in will this person show up for work every day and do the job. And in the cases of what we see with uh, Andrew Wiggins, he hasn't really shown up for work every day to do the job. And now he's saying that some of the fans in Minnesota are shitty. Yeah. That's yeah. what we got. Yeah, exactly. That's what we have. Yeah, exactly. And so that that you're you and that's not what you want for somebody you're paying that much amount of money. And so all these things are I like to say to people. It's a risk. I say this all the time. Drafting is a risk. It's a crapshoot. Nobody knows. People act like there are surefire picks, all this other stuff that people get it right. I was talking with a friend last year who told me, no, you got to take DeAndre A, and he's the guaranteed surefire pick. And I was like, nah, you should probably take Luka Doncic. And you know I've been on that train before. I don't have to pat myself on the back enough for that. But right. my problem is it's, it's a crapshoot. People see things that they like and how they fit with other teams, and some people don't see it, and none of us know. And this is why I can't always say – Tanking is necessarily the best way to get there. Um, and the NBA is probably nice if you can get a high pick, but it's not also uh, the greatest thing. The guy who just won Rookie of the Month was the ninth pick in the draft for the New York Knicks. We've seen Karis LeVert on the Nets, who's been a really good player, who's picked 20, uh, 20th. 20th, right? Yeah. You, you know what I say all the time is? I don't get stressed enough about where my team should be picking. I just want the scouts to do their job and find the best fits that fit with the players and the coaches. And if you do that well and you have good player development, you can build your team. So I, while I find the tanking fascinating to watch, I really do. I think sometimes watching the bottom can be as exciting as watching the top. And that's what's great about the league. You know what it comes down to? Do your homework. Find good picks where you are. you got to find the diamonds in the rough. And that's how you build good teams. <laughs> Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind-the-scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. I want to get your thoughts <clears throat> one more thing on this net situation. So with the signing of Spencer Dinwiddie, they're probably going to have between 40 and anywhere between like 40 and 70 something million dollars in cash space. It's probably going to be closer to that 40 mark because Alan Crabb's going to pick up his player option and all that stuff. With D'Angelo Russell, 
I mean, what do you do? Like, <laughs> what do you do personally? Because Me? yeah, if I was if I was Sean Marks right now, I'd be calling Phoenix. I'd be calling. Assuming uh, that hasn't happened, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm sure they call. They need point guards. I especially that's what I'm saying. Yeah, more so Orlando, not because I think they're more desperate, and I think they're in what we talked about the mo- the mode where they actually want to make the playoffs. Phoenix always needs a point guard, but they might want to take another look at a point guard for the rest of the season, see if they want to invest. They looked at Alfred Payton last year and decided to say they said no. Um, D'Angelo Russell might cost them a little bit more than Alfred Payton. The, my problem with those trades, and I've thought about this through and I've talked to you a little bit about this, I'm not necessarily sure how much good stuff Phoenix has that the Nets necessarily want mm. back or Orlando has that the Nets really want back that actually helps them. Exactly. You're probably looking at you're probably looking at what? Josh Jackson? And mm. I don't know what else. Mm. And then Orlando, best case scenario is Jonathan Isaac and a pick. And I'm not even sure that at or- Orlando wants to part with Jonathan Isaac because he has shown some flashes of his athletic ability. I, he's still very I, young. I, I can tell you I'm pretty sure John, uh, uh, Jonathan Isaac will not be parted from Orlando. I That's think, what I'm saying. I think if you if they called and, and the Nets were like, Sean Marks was like, yo, we want Jonathan Isaac, I think Orlando GM is hanging the phone up. Although I don't know because Sean Marks, uh, I have some theories about him potentially knowing voodoo because of some other trades that he's made in the past, including Justin Hamilton for Damari Carroll, a first-round pick, and a second-round pick. Oh, maybe he can. Maybe he can uh, I don't and the second-round pick was used to get Rodion's Karooks, and the first-round pick was Zan and Musa. Maybe he, maybe he can flee somebody again. But this is why you have to make those calls, and what I'm saying is here's the way I look at it. If you think there's a better option you can go get to run your team in the offseason, or maybe you're comfortable starting Spencer Dinwiddie, then you should actually explore that it, and save the flexibility. Here's or a, you can just wait and figure it out in the se- in the offseason. That's the thing. You don't, wanna, you don't want to potentially lose him for nothing because the way that the Nets have been screwing some teams over with these poison pill type of contracts. Somebody's going to poison pill you. D'Angelo mm-hmm. Russell is, and I wrote this, he is tailor-made to get that poison pill contract because he still does have a high ceiling, which he does show from time to time. And again, he's 23, and if he takes a poison pill contract, which, that four years will be up, and he'll be 27 years old. So you're getting, if not his prime, right before he hits his prime, well, which should thing. look better than his first four here's years. Here's the thing. You can't be scared about what you can do with the poison pill contract. If you get poison pilled, you've been giving the poison pill to other people, they can poison you back. It's all business. It's all it's all in the game. So if that happens, which could very well happen to Nets, they've done it with Charlie Johnson, they did it with Alan Crabb, they did it with Otto Porter. Mm-hmm. Um, those so are the three. Those are the three that we've seen this happen to. This can happen. I don't think it's a reason to make a move or not make a move. I, I think the Nets have to just look at the offers that are out there, see what's actually open for them, what they can do, and what works. Some, working, the best thing might be at February to trade deadline to be like, well, we can't get anything from him. Let's play it out through the season. Let's see how the offseason goes. If we choose to invest, we choose to invest. I'm sure they have their number in mind. I'm sure also D'Angelo has his number in mind. I that think that, he's some, get some, it. something tells me that those numbers are not. I, I think they're probably they're, far apart. They're pro- I don't know if they're far apart, but they're probably not the same. Right, that, and, 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 and But it never is. But here's the thing that's interesting, though, right? So you do sign them, and there's something to be said for the culture that the Nets want to push forward and continue culture. to do that, right? And continue to do those things and push that forward, right? With D'Angelo Russell, if you keep him, that does send – a good message in terms of look we we this is a reclamation project we took him on when the lakers didn't want him we made that trade and now look we're keeping him long term this is part of our culture going forward yada 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 whatever mm. it sends a good message if they were to in theory take care of him however Does it? you're tying up a lot of money if that were to happen into the point guard spot with him with Spencer Dinwiddie, who I guess would be the sixth man on that much bigger contract, a contract that's bigger than what he had had by a lot, like by ten million, nine million, whatever it is, right? And then you're looking at probably twenty something million in cap space, so you probably have room for one more max contract, or do you? Because Alan Crabb comes off the books the next season, and Karis Levert's going to be a restricted free agent, so then you have yeah, to be wary him. of that. Also, then Jared Allen is. The following year, also, so it's like, it's like I'm not sure. I'm fascinated by the situation. I think that if the Nets probably had their way, my guess, my guess, my educated guess is that he would have a similar contract to Dinwiddie's, not in worth because he's going to be worth more, but in terms of two plus one with a player option, something like that. Well, if they could do something like that, to be interested, I'm not here for this. I don't um, know if D'Angelo's here for that I'm either. Probably what I'm saying, I'm not here for. I'm not here for this. 
oh, we're going to take care of you to show that it's good for a reclamation project. I'm not here for that. You know what you should be doing? If you want to get taken care of, stop turning over the damn ball. <laughs> How about that? You Because I'm I'll sit in the negotiating table like, you want to get taken care of, you want to get paid a certain way, stop turning over the ball. Because this is the problem of what we're talking about. And it's not about good faith. It's about, this is sports. It's about business. About business is about results. Yeah. What have you done for me lately? Yeah. And lately, D'Angelo Russell's been turning over the ball. He's been inconsistent. And there are some games where he can't get off the bench. And Spencer Bidden with has looked like the better player handling the ball and we talked about and texted jurors through one game I think it was a Memphis game we were texting through that who do I trust with their ball in the hands down the stretch and I was like right now Spencer Dinwiddie and that's the reason I would have chosen Dinwiddie over Russell not saying you can't have both this is somebody who's very high in D'Angelo Russell coming out of school right so I but I'm not here this 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 is the big boys grown man's adult league we're not here to pay you because we want a reclamation project we're here to pay you for what either you have done or what we think you can be the leadership the value you have on the court and if you're not showing that value then you're still get paid and you can move on and sometimes for a team that's okay yeah that's fine yeah because there's something to be said for like having those having that flexibility that they've wanted ever since they've lost that Boston trade and having those options yes and that's a great point and losing D'Angelo Russell you're not you're gonna have those flex you're gonna have that level and of flexibility maybe, you're gonna have those options and maybe just having that flexibility is okay especially because you need that because you said you, you just profoundly brought up you haven't had the picks you haven't had the cap space mm -hmm. now you have a chance to have all of that and control your own destiny yeah and maybe that's worth more than actually keeping this guy here that maybe doesn't fit into the c word your culture yeah or maybe he shows between now and the end of the season the last three months that he has taken a step and he does and you and and you do and then i would say then the, then, the and arguments will be is that too small of a sample to judge from those are all risks that you take, right? Yeah. Because we saw what you just brought up on Minnesota did in the small Wiggins. sample. Right. And so it's it's all a risk. There's no perfect answer. Brian doesn't have the answer. I don't have the answer. Yeah. I'm not even sure Sean Marks fully has the answer. Yeah. So it's and, all interesting to watch. And me personally, what I would do is I would just continue to wait. I would just continue to wait. I'm kind of with that, man. I would just I'm continue with that. to wait because yeah. you do have another. You have a month. You have a month until the trade. I think line. you do. I, I would continue to wait. Obviously, do your due diligence as the Nets have done with pretty much everybody. Do your due diligence. Take calls. Make calls. Do what you got to do. Gain don't information. Don't push the panic button. But I, I would just wait and to see if he can prove that he can continue to do this. Like I feel like Dean uh, Spencer Dinwiddie proved enough to get his contract, and also that number is very team friendly. His contract is very team-friendly. Oh, 10, 11, absolutely. 12 million, three years, you know, with a player option. It's after still very two. tradable. Not that I want him to be traded. But right. It's still tradable. Right. He's I, a, yeah. Your so. point's well taken. The point is, and this probably goes with everything with, with tanking to wrap it up, you don't have to push the panic button. Don't. You don't have to push the panic button. Now, um, you're, you're New York Knicks. I'm interested by them. Interested? Yes. I don't know if, they, I don't know if interested or interesting <laughs> is anything anybody says these days around the Knicks. You're interested? Why? Because, because we, they could take. Because they could get Zion Williamson. Because they could get Kevin Durant. It's, well, you know what it is. I I don't think they're that far away. I legitimately don't. See, yeah, when people say that, I I, I don't have think to that, I ask don't, a question. Far away from what? Far away from being one of the I guess top four teams in the East. I don't think they're terribly far off. And far off is what? A year? Two years? Hmm. Okay, here's what I think. Let me talk. I don't think two again. years is far off, but some talk. people do. I I say I could say inside of two years, inside of two years, from being a top four team. These the, ne the Nets too, by the way. It, whether whatever happens with that D'Angelo Russell situation, I think you know, regardless whether they keep him or not, something will be there, and Karis Levert will also be there, and Jared Allen's going to take a step. Like they have those things working for them with the Knicks. I don't know. I'm just I just think that I feel like they are going to get something in free agency. I have no idea what. <laughs> nobody's nobody's excited about that. Something. Yeah. Something hasn't always been good for the Knicks. In terms but here's of here's the thing. I don't know if it's Kevin Durant. I'm 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 not sure if I'm buying that whole. You know what I mean? Because something tells me that Kevin Durant can stay in Golden State and then Draymond Green gets traded somewhere to like Orlando, <laughs> and just disappears for a few seasons. He would hate that. <laughs> oh, he'd be mad as hell being now. Oh, Orlando. I would love that though. Because that'd be so that'd be so petty NBA drama. But with with the Knicks, so you're looking at Enos Cantor, Emmanuel Moutier, Mario Hazonia, Trey Burke, Noah Vonley, 
all have expiring contracts this season. Mm-hmm. Luke Cornett does too, but I don't sort of put him in the same light because I feel like he's someone that they're trying to see if they could keep him long term, mm-hmm. or they're trying to up his trade value now by starting him and seeing if they could get something out of him as well. But for all those guys that I mentioned, I feel like Enos Cantor could get you something back, right? Could get you something in in the in the form of draft picks, assets, whatever. I told you about my one hypothetical trade: Enos Cantor for Bismack Biyombo and a couple draft picks, and then you buy out Bismack Biyombo, who has a seventeen million dollar player option next year. So you're gonna have to figure that out. But I think that if Charlotte is really desperate and wants to make the playoffs. I think Enos Cantor would be able to help them, and I think that taking back Bismarck Bayombo will definitely get you some picks because they don't want to continue to pay someone averaging one point and one rebound a game seventeen million dollars a season. I don't. I mean, if James Jones is willing to buy him out for everything, then fine. Because I don't want to see Bismarck Bayombo anywhere you can, near no, my no, roster. No, you can't see him. No, but I think. But here's what I'm saying is that I think that that's something that will get you picks, right? So that's one. I don't know what kind of picks. Maybe a couple. Maybe two seconds. That'll be good. Maybe even they're de- maybe even they're desperate enough to give you a first. Maybe they give you a future first. Maybe they give you a future first and a second. I don't think that's out of the uh, realm of possibility. If you gave me a future, if you told me you get a future first and a second this year for Bismack Biyombo and Enos Cantor, Enos, for Enos Cantor, and the Knicks would take back Bismack Biyombo and automatically I'm buy just him saying, out. If Charlotte, I would sign for that in a heartbeat. If Charlotte really wants to make the playoffs. I mean, it should. He would be their second-best player automatically. Automatically, which it sounds like they would. And by the way, it does make sense, even though Enos Cancer's game is not necessarily friendly toward the new NBA. But I don't know what the hell Charlotte is doing. New NBA, old NBA, whatever. Their best player is Kemba Walker. It does make sense to pair him with a center who can rebound, who can get you buckets. If you want to make the playoffs, right. that is, right? And I do think that Enos Cancer, say what you want, that makes him a better team. That definitely makes him a better team. Oh, I agree. I don't disagree with that. You know, you're replacing not a, Bismack not awful, Biombo not with a, Enos Cancer. It's not an awful trade. I got to see what else they get. Okay. Uh, Emmanuel Moutier. Now, Who I think they should trade, too, and can get something for They him. have to. They have to. I don't think that's someone you should commit to, right? I agree. Uh, Phoenix... Obviously comes to mind. Orlando obviously comes to mind. I have no idea what they can do as far as that. I did mention to you that Jonathan Simmons has a 6.7 or something like that. Now million that dollar team this trade option. you mentioned, I liked. Yeah, Jonathan Simmons has a team option for next year. He is not having a very good season. I think he's down to seven or eight points a game, something like that, which is down from last year where he was over double figures. Emmanuel Moutier, Jonathan Simmons, and I feel like you can get a pick out of that as well. As if Orlando still Probably feels, a second rounder. yeah, but, but still, and then you have Jonathan Simmons where you could evaluate him, but you're probably not gonna. You're probably, well, I, like, I actually like Jonathan Simmons. Yeah, and I wanted Knicks to sign him two years ago, and you're you're probably not gonna keep him for that six point seven million dollar player option. But he's somebody who's versatile, and I feel like with Emmanuel Mudiay, you can get a pick back, and that's a, that's a deal that I thought of that would make sense. I could see them keeping Jonathan Simmons for the next season. I would be upset about that. You think the Knicks could get something back from Mario Hazonia? No. <laughs> no, I don't. I saw a hypothetical no. with I saw a hypothetical with Courtney Lee, a second round pick for Zach Randolph's contract. I, you talked about this too. I yeah, Courtney Lee. I still didn't get something back from at the trade deadline because he's contracts friendly. Yeah, somebody will still want to pay him the thirteen million dollars next year. Yeah, they get a, a team, the Kings, a, a Kings or a team that could get him. He Zach Randolph's there doing nothing. Another team that could use him again and need some wing shooting. Memphis could definitely easily go back there. Mm. They could use him again. I don't know what they would give up if they want to give up a young player like a Dylan Brooks, which I probably doubt that they would. Yeah, I doubt that. Um, maybe, but you don't know. Maybe, maybe they would. I don't know what they would do. The Zach Randolph thing is good because you get money off the books immediately. Zach Randolph is not going to have a second run in New York. And and one more because I don't think so, yeah. I don't think Trey Burke gets you back anything. No, Noah Vonley though. I think he could because I think he's done good stuff with his games. I'm. It's interesting because I think he's also someone that I mean, you sure you wouldn't want to keep him? Are you sure you wouldn't want to keep him? I. You know what I mean? Like, here's here's what about Noah Vonley. What I would do. I'm not necessarily as keen on trading trading Noah Vonley. Right. I might leave Noah Vonley, see what happens in the draft and who you get and how your front court's going to look when KP comes back. But he's a guy I might try to bring back on a team-friendly deal. Off the bench. I like what he does off the bench. He can stretch the floor. He started hitting some threes. He rebounds he well. Pass. He plays tough. He can pass. He, he brings the ball up the court. I'm yeah. a big Noah Vonley fan. I like Vonley. I think he's been good. I don't think you trade him. Everybody else can pretty much... Go. I still think you got to be patient with the other young players. I'm still in the be patient on Frank Nilakina camp, although he's been very disappointed this year. I have no doubt about saying he's been I think he's the only player in the NBA who is true shooting percentage is 45% or lower the last What's couple, two seasons. What's killing me is he, his shot looks fine and he takes 
pretty good shots. Doesn't take bad shots. Still not being aggressive though. No, but and he, and he misses open shots and they look good. It's just like you can't get him in. You could. He's I somebody think, who you could visibly tell he struggles with his confidence. But I see. I feel like it's gone down. I feel like it was already kind of teetering and not being aggressive. He had that one game recently where he went off, yep. right? And then he had like 17 points, and then it was like nothing again. He got hurt, so just the reason he got hurt. But, yeah, but I'm still like, you know, be patient with him. Get him another year. I'm still willing to get I, – I think you got to evaluate players three to four years. You can't go. But I've seen enough of Moody. I agree with you. The Knicks should try to sell the assets they have to get cap space and picks. You know why? Because you never know how that can help you come draft day. You never know how that can help you in the tr- in the trading in the offseason. they got to gather more assets to go with the young core they have. But I'm with you. I don't think they're that far off. Now here's why. Let me get into why. Next season, you're looking at these are the guys that you're committed to, right? Mitchell Robinson, 1.6 million. Damian Dotson, 1.6 million. Lonzo Trier, you're going to pick up that option. Oh, uh, that's 3.6 million. Yep. Kevin Knox will be here. Frank Nilakina's option is picked up. He's interesting because I actually don't think his fourth year option will get picked up, and they have until before the next season to do that, and that's 6.1 million. I actually don't think that they're going to pick that up if he's still here. But we'll get into that. In well, I think a lot of that depends on how he plays down the stretch. Yep, this season. Yeah, and he might have to play in summer league again. Um, Lance Thomas is isn't that an option? That's not an option. Seven point five million. I thought that was an option. Huh. Interesting. Nope. nope. Oh. I think it's the last year of his deal. Oh, 2K needs to fix that then because oh. it's an option in the game. Oh, uh, Courtney Lee. They also oh, have, he doesn't play for me in the Knicks in 2K, but that's They also have Alonzo Trier's contract is wrong. Oh, they have yeah. to he's, – he's, he's making more money than that. Courtney Lee, $12.8 million committed to him. Your boy, Tim Hardaway Jr., $18.2 million committed to him. Chris Asport Zink is not yet committed to, but, We're I mean, taken care of you're pretty night. sure that that'll happen. Although, I'm, I feel like they're not on the same page for whatever reason. I, I don't actually know that. Um, when we eventually do have Ian Begley here soon this month, spoiler alert, uh, we're going to talk about that. But I do want to know because I feel like they're not on the same page right now. Just just from Why? What just from what I'm reading and just from how I feel, I feel like, I don't know. I don't well, know. Here's the thing. Nobody's ever on the same page at the beginning of contract negotiation. <laughs> like, you want to get paid a certain amount for your work, and the company wants to pay you as little as they can to, for you to perform at a high level. I know That's this. How it I know this from experience. Yes, this is. And how I am it not works. talking about Nets Daily guys. Right. This is how. It, well, that's a whole other story. There are a bunch of companies out there that don't want to pay you at all. Right. Um. But that that yeah, exploiting people. We've gone through that before. Um. <laughs> No, that's just what it is. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I think nobody tips their hand. This is what happens. Nobody wants to tip their hand in this stuff. I get it. And certain players know they've brought a certain level of le- – they have some leverage, and sometimes it's only times you have leverage. And KP's going to use the leverage they have, and the Knicks are going to use the leverage they have, and that's it. I, that's all it is. Here's the thing. With that roster, you're looking at – you're going to have cap space. I don't know how much. The Knicks are going to have some form of cap space even after signing – Porzingis to a max contract. They will not have that much, no, but I think they're going to have like twenty million. They'll have enough for that. one more max slot. Yeah, they should. They'll just be they over the could. cap, but they could do that, and then you'll still have the mid level exception, right? I still think that you fill that max slot with somebody who's top tier. I threw out a name Uh-oh. recently uh, when we were talking to. I was talking to Gerard and Darrell before the game because we were just sort of playing with the situation. I was like, look. We were talking about, oh, what happens if they're if they're like fifth in the draft, right? I was like, I mean, I wouldn't rule out look, what if you're five and you really, really, really want to get to two? I mean, if you pair Nilakina, Dotson, and the fifth overall pick, you can't move up a couple slots? You do you think it's impossible? They probably would want Trier instead of Dotson, but I'm not sure. They might want Mitchell Robinson. Yeah. I don't want to give him up though. But they might want him. Oh man, I, I, I'm high on his shot blocking potential, and I feel like he is the perfect, the perfect center play next to, to play next to Porzingis. I agree. Yes. So that's why I wouldn't give he's, him up. He's a, Do he, I, him, Jared Allen. Those are the kind of could centers that you get you to number two? Yes, but it depends on who's at number two. That's it. All depends on the team and their need. Right. Yeah. Now yeah, for yeah. Lando sitting at number two, which they're kind of ways off for the chance. Of, you never know. A team like that sitting at number two needs a point guard. Yeah, it might work. But I, I, I could see them trading Dotson, Nilakina. I could even see them potentially trading Tim Hardaway Jr. this year. Uh, I don't know who's going to want to take him this year. They're probably more inclined to take him next year. I know Gerard throughout Utah, and I said that that could be possible because Donovan Mitchell does need help, although I'm not sure that that's where you want to get help. But I no. was look, But I'm looking at the team, and I'm like, hmm, Kemba Walker's a free agent. 
you wouldn't sign for maybe potentially teaming up Kemba Walker with Chris Stapps Porzingis. I think that Nick makes the Knicks very interesting, and I'm just saying that for it, for for what though? I'm just saying for how much because Kemba's. I, I mean, he's going to be a max player. He's going to be a max I, player. I, you, I, the reason why I say that is because you're going to have the money. They're going to want to do something now, and. I don't. I'm, you can't bank on them getting Kawhi or Kevin Durant, who no, might stay with their respective you can, teams. But maybe, but maybe sometimes when you don't get the the, the A listers, you just get a bunch of other guys, or you just don't. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, how about that? Like, why? Like, why do? You, why is there this need? It's like you know what it is. It's like because I have money. I, it's like money's burning a hole in your pocket. I have to spend it. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because it's Kemba Walker, and, and I like Kemba. I like Kemba. I covered Kemba. Kemba with Porzingis would be very interesting. Interesting. You know what you said. You know what interesting is not? Interesting did not say championship contention. Um, You know what? But if you do have some good role players around them, Mitchell Robinson does take a step and things like that. Like Or I, Knox takes a step more. Right. Right. That would be your In theory, that'll be your big three. You'd rather have Knicks, Kemba Walker, Porzingis, than Tobias Harris and Porzingis. I like I love Tobias Harris. But here's the thing: Tobias Harris, Kevin Knox. What's the yeah, difference? Yeah, I mean, you know, well, Tobias is probably a little bit better of a shooter, but I'm not going. Well, to. well yeah, but, but it's redundant but, as a player. But you know what I'm saying? What, yeah, what, yeah. what, what I would say is, if the Knicks told me this offseason, that's probably Kevin Knox's ceiling. By the way, if they ended up, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. If the Knicks ended up signing Kemba Walker, would I be upset? No. Would I want better? You'll be, you'll be excited. You'll be excited. Come uh, on. I that mean, new that New York connection. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm excited if Kevin comes sits here, sits here on the podcast. We can talk about that. Oh, please, I would love that. Probably you already make, know. We might be able to make. We could probably make that happen. Can we? Probably make that happen. Yeah. Anyway, let's not tease <laughs> people too much. Um, I'm not, I, I, I just don't think it's 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 not it 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 slightly excites me. It just gets the blood pumping and the juices flowing. But it's not, you know, it's not Kevin, Kevin Durant and Kawhi. I might damn near pass out. Kevin Durant and Kawhi. Kawhi, yeah, and not and I, or, or or sorry, or, yeah, Kevin Durant and Kawhi. Well, they don't have the space. Yeah, but like, they don't. But I don't think got, those guys are gonna team up either. I no, I don't think so either. Um, I can see Kawhi. Which brings me to course. before we wrap this up, this kind of brings me to another thing. Getting off the Knicks real quick. Yeah. Like, well, whatever the Knicks do, we'll see. Yeah, well, I mean, options. we can leave it at that. But I'm, options. but I, I, I don't think the. I think New York basketball is going to be very interesting. They have season. options, okay? It's going to be very interesting. New York and Brooklyn. All right. Uh, another another star who just got traded and is now reports that he's not getting along with his teammates again. Speaking of free agents to Jimmy be. Jimmy Butler. Oh, man. I saw this report from Woj, and I was like, man. What's going on? I know what's going on. I know what's going on. The same thing that's happened before. What's going on? <laughs> no, the same thing that's happened before. Here's the thing, man. At some point when you start working, if you're working someplace and you start hearing the rumors that this person's a hard person to work with and every place they go to, the uh, there's issues with that person, something's happening, hey, Jimmy Butler, you might want to look in the mirror. The, the problem might be you, right? Like the problem just might be you. I don't know Jimmy Butler personally. I like Jimmy Butler as a player. I think he's hard-nosed. I think he wants to win. I don't question his work ethic or bringing it to the job every day. I don't question that one bit. Andrew Wiggins, he's not. Here's okay? The, here's the thing. But, bruh, I have a, I have you've a... now come to Philadelphia. You're trying to acclimate yourself with uh, Embiid and Simmons, who we've heard through the grapevine. They don't also have necessarily the best relationship, and you wonder how that star pair is going to go, and now you're trying to tell Brett Brown how to do his thing? I'm just saying, like, I've been rooting for Philly. I want to see him do good. I want to trust the process. I like Joel Embiid. However, however. But come on, man. I agree <clears throat> to a point regarding Jimmy Butler, but he may not be their biggest problem. <laughs> no, and I know where you're going, and I'm not, I, I don't think you're wrong. It may not be him, and man. their biggest problem is? Their biggest problem might be. Your boy Ben Simmons. My, why is he my boy? <laughs> Not my well, boy, Nick Medellino's boy, boy Ben Simmons. Ben, ben Simmons. We, I, no, I want to talk. Nick's got to come back up here to talk about this because I told him that Nick knows. I told. I said your boy's got to start shooting, man. It might be Ben Simmons, man. And explain. <laughs> and explain what was that? This Iron Eagle reacting to my uh, my Brian bomb. Okay. <laughs> um. 
I think what Brian is talking about when he says Ben Simmons is the problem, and I will let you say is I that, tweeted out this yes. trade on Twitter. The one you told me yesterday. Yes. That I actually think is a good trade. And I think their problem is that Ben Simmons, not that he can't shoot, but he won't shoot. Yes. And it doesn't appear that he eventually will shoot. Like, it's cool to say with people, once they get a jumper, they'll be great. Michael Jordan ended up developing a jumper. John Wall is somebody who you have to guard from three-point line, even though his jumper's not necessarily been historically but great. But you respect it. you got to put a hand up. Even Rondo's gotten better, but look how damn long that took him. But with Ben Simmons, he's not. you don't have to guard him <laughs> when he's at the three-point line. You could sag off of him and double Joel Embiid in the playoffs, and he's not going to do anything. And he doesn't even want to get to the free throw line, it seems like. And I want to stop you there. That's why you heard. I think Joel Embiid had a comment, I think it was a week ago or so, about how he, since the trade he's been getting triple teamed. And I knew that wasn't that you're talking about Jimmy Butler while he's getting triple teamed. He's getting triple teamed because your man's out there isn't shooting the ball. The trade that I tweeted out, because Philly wants to win now, it's very apparent. Otherwise, you don't make that Jimmy Butler trade where you give up some pretty good players, Dario Saric, Robert Covington, even though Saric hasn't been quite as good in Minnesota. Covington's been really good. Covington's been really good. He's fit that team well, and they needed that defense with Towns and Wiggins there, I mean. <laughs> but Ben Simmons, Wilson Chandler, expiring contract, 12 or so million. Markel Fultz for Damian Lillard because Portland's got to do something as, as well. They're another team that they need to get over the hump. It's, or not even get to the hump and just reset. They need to reset. They I, need to do something because clearly it's not working, and I'm sure they'd rather trade C.J. McCollum, but with Damian Lillard there, and it works out contractually, did it with the trade machine and all that, works out fine. Maybe maybe, maybe Portland also wants a pick. If you're Philly, you do it. But I think that with those three guys, you could say, like, oh, there's only one ball to go around. We thought the same thing once upon a time with LeBron, Wade, and Bosch, with Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett. And I feel like the, 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 those guys, when they're that good, they figure it out. That's, that's, what, that, that's basically uh, yeah. where I'm going with Philly. Because those three, you can tell, those guys are all dogs. They want to win. Like Damian uh, Lillard. I, I'd, I'd love that. I'd Damian love to see Lillard, that team. Joel Embiid, and Jimmy Butler, they would want nothing more than to just win. And I feel like they'll figure it out. I by agree. the way, Joel Embiid, you want space? Damian Lillard going to give you that space. J- Damian Lillard they, here on one side, Jimmy Butler all the way on the other, and Embiid will have a lot of room to work on the inside. He can even pop out still. You still have that pick-and-pop game. Jimmy Butler could still be their defensive stopper, all those things. I still would want a couple. I still would want some uh, them to fortify their bench if they made that trade. Right, yeah, but, agreed. I, this is one of you know a lot and, of people. A and, lot of, and Portland, if you do want to like reset, why wouldn't you want to take a flyer on Markel Fultz? I mean, and you have Ben Simmons, who's already an elite defender, right? Uh, fantastic. You try pastor, to get that jump shot elite, from Ben Simmons. And maybe you can get it and put him next to McCollum. See, actually, it's funny. I think Ben Simmons would work better with the pieces they have in Portland around him than he does right now, and he'd be in a city where there's a lot less pressure mm-hmm. um, that he does not have in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia's trying to win now. They got Towns to win now. Jimmy Butler's trying to win now. Jimmy Butler's pretty much letting them know like. I think Jimmy Butler is complaining about the coaching offensive philosophy, but now you got me wondering more. Is he complaining really about the fact that your boy won't shoot? In reading between the lines, and knowing Jimmy Butler a little bit more now because we've we've learned we about saw, him, and we see what he did Angie. He didn't like the Angie Wiggins was not necessarily showing up. Not that I so, don't think Ben Simmons. I don't think Ben Simmons is cut from the same cloth that Andrew Wiggins is cut from. But I think that, I don't know that he's not either. By the way, I don't know that he's not. I don't. I'm just saying I don't think so. I don't think so. What mm-hmm. I think is I think. There's, okay, let me put this like this. It appears, as I would say, I think you were onto something earlier in this podcast, in that Andrew Wiggins may have had an effect of, yo, I got paid and now I'm kind of chilling. Mm. I think Ben Simmons is motivated to be great. I think he wants to be great. But does he fear the failure of his shot and where it is now instead of trying to actually work on it in game situations? We saw these videos in the summer of Ben Simmons shooting in the gym, hitting shots, which annoyed me that people were posting this because I'm like, who cares? Jaleel Okafor did it too. Yeah. He's on New Orleans' bench. Don't care. Or can you do it in the game? Because that's what, cause that's what gets you paid. That's what keeps you in the court. And that's what makes Brian Fonseca not be able to mention your name <laughs> in a trade. Right? Ben, like, if he was doing the game, we wouldn't be talking about this. Ben Simmons, uh, I don't, I recall 
watching him during warm-ups recently when the Nets played the Sixers a second time. I saw him during warm-ups. I was there pretty much for his entire routine before Kenny Atkinson gave out his uh, pregame address or whatever. I don't recall Ben Simmons shooting a lot of jumpers mm. in warm-ups. You know what I mean? And this is where I, I've seen anybody shoot threes in warm-ups. I see Jared Allen do it all the time. And he'll do it. He'll do it in the game Look, occasionally. You could only. Why is Jared Allen shooting more threes than Ben Simmons? I don't know. Come on, fam. But I, maybe that <laughs> maybe that does say something about Ben Simmons. Maybe it does say something about he can't either. I don't know if it's mental. I don't. I don't know. And I don't like to really get into the minds of players and things. I know I'm always very sensitive with the Marco Fultz stuff. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. But I it is bothering me because I I had dinner with a couple of my boys in Philly uh, earlier the last year. And we were talking about this before the season. And they're big Sixer fans. And my one boy, he's not as high in Simmons because of the reasons that we're talking about. And one of the things I said to my boy, uh, shout out to my boy Ricky Reed, was that, yo, he's got to shoot this year, man. Mm-hmm. Like, if he does not shoot, it's going to be problematic for you. And when you've added Jimmy Butler, who's not like a great three-point shooter, but he's not a bad three-point shooter, and you have this guy who can't shoot, Ben Simmons is talented. He can get to the paint. He's long. He's tall. He can pass at elite level. He's a hell of a defensive player already. So there's things I love about his game. But if you don't shoot, you at least got to shoot. Even Rondo on those Celtics teams, and I understand he had three Hall of Famers around him, he shot the ball. He shot the ball. Even when teams sagged off him, he shot the ball. You know, you got to shoot. You got to – to Cole Herman was, you got to play to win the game. Yeah. Hey, Ben Simmons, you ain't playing right now. And real quick, because we got to get to the number and wrap this up, but with Philly, I feel like, look, you go through the overall landscape of the NBA, Golden State doesn't look as good as they've been. I don't know if that's going to change. Right, right. Is Toronto really unbeatable? Boston doesn't really look quite as good as we thought they were going to be. You look around and you're like, hey. Yo, we won't move. We could be there. We can go, we, we can get there. And the Jimmy Butler move might not have been enough, as you can see, because they have their own sort of issues right now. So I'm like, hey, if you do this one other thing, you go for it this year, I'll tell you what, they make that trade. I might be rolling with Philly to go all the way to the finals. I mean, I, let's, look, <laughs> I, they, they, look, there's a lot of trades to get put out of there, and there's a lot of um, illogical trades. But you texted me that one, and I was like, yo, that's, that's actually makes sense. Like, Look, man, I think I, I legitimately good. think I could work in basketball operations. Just not at a high position because I got to learn a lot. I don't trust you. I think you bring violence to the front. <laughs> <laughs> I don't but, trust you. But ben, well, Simmons, ben Simmons, Stephen A. has one question for you. What you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to shoot? 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 Gonna shoot? Uh, real quick, before, before we get to the numbers, um, any concern about LeBron's injury? Lakers struggle a little bit. Yes, because it's affecting my fantasy team. Oh, that was personal. I'm losing to Greg this week. Uh, okay, Greg. And I would be killing him if I had LeBron. Greg, we're going to have to have a whole podcast on people like you <laughs> who are at the top of fantasy leagues but still want to try to trade every day. He offered uh, me a trade today. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> that, 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 uh, He's sh- trying to get Chris done. <laughs> shout out to our boy Greg who does the video sometime for us here. Uh, right. <laughs> um, so you're concerned. I, I, it, look, I, I, it's still possible that I might beat him. I'm still not possible. necessarily concerned because now the Lakers have Kuzma. I'm not, no, I'm not concerned. They're and, just being cautious. They're and just being cautious. Uh, Kuzma's out. LeBron's out. And Rondo's out for a little bit. Look, anytime you take away your two best players, um, and then you have you two, think Kuzma's the second best player? Absolutely. Okay. And your and your ball handler, um, your second best ball handler there in Rondo, that's going to mm. hurt the team. What's just told? What what I think the Lakers be? I think one and four in these games without LeBron, it shows you how quickly you can fall in the West. One injury can change a lot of things in the West. They were in third or fourth, I think, on Christmas Day. And at the time of recording this podcast, they're now sitting in eighth. This is why the West is fascinating to watch. And and you're talking about the dude who's probably been the MVP every season since 2007. I <laughs> even though he has not won the award every year, but you I, you, you know, know what I mean. Yes, I know I mean, what you mean. But you get a, you get the sense like even the Lakers are not bad without him. But no. you get a sense of the value that he brings the because va- yes, like uh, outside of one game where they looked really good and won. And they should have. They won, they lost a tough game. They won one game against Sacramento. They lost they a tough lost game to the, li- the, the, to the Knicks. Knicks. Yeah, but you know, like I said, they took a, take out your two best players and your other best ball handler you're coming off the bench. That's a lot, man. That's a lot, and so that's tough for anybody. But to answer your question, no, I'm not concerned. And remember, I had them going to the Western Conference Finals uh, before the season began. I'm not weirdly wavering off that because it's not like LeBron's not going to come back, and I still feel like they're going to make some sort of move. Uh, one other trade I was sort of spitballing in my head is how they can try to get Anthony Davis by using, you know, Ingram and Lonzo Ball. Now, the way the Pelicans are going, I think that's more and more as likely to happen. But Yeah, although I do think that Boston might have the better trade package with maybe a Tatum, a Marcus Smart, 
the uh, arms the arms race for Anthony Davis is gonna be interesting. I think it's those two teams at the top. I don't know who else. I mean, maybe Philly, but that wouldn't make sense. But, I don't think um, they have enough assets right But there. that wouldn't make sense. It'd probably Boston or Lakers. But regardless, I still think the Lakers are going to do something to get LeBron some help. help. Um, so I still roll with that, but I really like what Oklahoma City's doing. They play defense. They're Paul good. George is an MVP candidate right I now. I know, but he doesn't get enough credit we're talking about. Paul it. George is an MVP candidate right now, and obviously Russell Westbrook will probably take some of the fifth place or fourth place or whatever votes from him, but Paul George should oh, be he up shouldn't. There. Russell Westbrook actually hasn't shot the ball well this season. He shouldn't. But I, I want also people need to start giving Russell Westbrook credit because Russell Westbrook has also shot the ball I get, a lot less this I give season. him credit because, yeah, he's deferring to Paul George, yeah, which well, is what he should be doing. But why? Why he doesn't get that credit. And I, you know, I'm a I Westbrook fan. I feel like he fan. is. I feel no, like. I don't think he is. Well, we, we, we were talking we'll about two different it. audiences. Maybe or maybe for maybe some people that really I, talk I've about seen him. I've seen I've seen a good amount of people give him credit. I, I think def- I think I think he's deferred and I think he's done the things that he's always been doing, rebounding and passing the ball, but it's just not as magnified because yeah. he's even on games where he shot badly, I'm like, oh man, he's still rebounding, yeah. he's still hustling. I still think Stephen Adams is letting him get some rebounds, right. but yeah. He t- he takes away <laughs> Steve- rebounds from Stephen Adams. That's all that story. <laughs> right. Um but so whatever. All right, let's pick a number. Fifty nine is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so just give it to Charles Barkley. <laughs> okay. Alright, I got that. Um let's see. Carlos Carrasco. <laughs> Alright, uh, I'll take your silence as a uh, loud uh no. Uh Guillermo Moda. I'm a huge fan of his when he when he was a relief a setup guy for the Mets. Yeah, but No, no. <laughs> I don't feel that strongly about him, but yeah. Uh Oliver Perez. No, <laughs> No. <laughs> yes. I'm thinking yes, yes. Are you really? I am. Oliver Perez? Yeah. What the hell is wrong with well, you? Well, man, Ali P. You're not being serious. I am being serious. <laughs> Jack Ham. He was a Hall of Fame linebacker in like the yeah. 70s or something like that. I don't really know him like that. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> London Fletcher. Great linebacker. That's the one that I thought of. Donnie Edwards. I don't even yeah. remember where I got that name from. Football player. Yep, I don't. Seth Joyner. Mm-hmm. See, all these you're like kind of like, ah, Luke Keekley. <laughs> no. Really? Really? No, I like Luke Keekley from when he played in the, the Panthers. He's retired now, right? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Luke Keekley's playing anymore. D'Amico Ryans. No. Luke Keekley's definitely still playing. Is he still in the Panthers? Yeah, he's an all pro. Oh. He's an all pro this year. I thought he was, I thought he was going <laughs> to leave forever. Okay. Whitney Merciless, a name that I love. Merciless. Yeah. No. No. All right, fine. Uh, Antonio Bastardo. <laughs> no. Jose Lobatone. Hell Matthew no. Feniz's boy, who he was very excited about when Last they year. trade. No. <laughs> no. All right, fine. Um, And the guys who wore 59 for a season in the minor leagues, but none of these are during that relevant. Uh, no. We don't even want to get into Jim no. Tomey, Justin Verdon, no. Felix Hernandez, Brad Rackey, and Jose Batista. No. All right, fine. You know, let's give it to Luke Keekley, man. I agree. I'm gonna rock with Luke Keekly. <laughs> I was tr- I was really rocking with my boy Ali Vito. I agree. Uh, I think I think Luke Keekly uh, Luke Keekly means that we're uh, also Team Cam Newton in some respect. So oh shoot, forgot to get some stuff in to somebody, but whatever. I just realized something I did not do today, but it's okay. <laughs> I was supposed to be in this like football NFL playoff pool name thing, and I didn't submit it by the certain time we recorded it. So no, oh, well. whatever. I might have a couple minutes to do. It. I might try to do it, but we'll see. Um, that's it. All right, so I'm late for stuff, but we are late and gone over on this podcast. That's it for episode 59, the Luke Keekley episode. Thank you for your support in the new year. We have a lot of more good stuff coming. You heard from Brian. We also have some more good guests coming on the way. Talk some basketball, some hip-hop. So a lot of good things coming up uh, to talk about. Thank you for your continued support. Continue to support us there. And thank you for the people that are helping us uh, with sponsoring us in the new year. We thank you for all that. That's it, episode 59, the Hotel Podcast. Till next time, peace. Thank you.